Hey everyone, Fintech here, and in this video, I'm going to go over my top nine stocks to invest in right now. These high growth positions are all stocks that I own, and they represent the companies that I think have the best chance of returning a very positive return going forward. And if you watched my previous portfolio reviews, this should be an exciting one, since there's been so many changes in the portfolio with more than half of these companies reporting earnings in the last month. So let's not waste any time, and let's open up my brokerage account and share it with the whole internet, because I'm kind of insane, and I think this is a good idea. So this is my Charles Schwab brokerage account and it includes all the different stocks that I own in individual stock accounts. And you can see that over the past month, the account is down around 30%. But if we zoom out all the way to the two year view, I'm still up around 73% overall. Now this is actually a little bit higher than my portfolio has actually done because I've also added money to the account and for some reason Charles Schwab counts that as your portfolio gaining in value. Now obviously just looking at this chart we can see how badly the tech sector has been affected recently. With it dropping from a tie in November of my portfolio at $287,000 to now down all the way to $122,000 which is a very serious drop. That being said, while buying in November was probably a bad idea, that also means that now stocks are cheaper than they've been at any point between now and last November, which to me means that there are opportunities everywhere to invest in. So with that said, let's dive into my first stock position. My first and largest position overall is Datadog, which I currently own 401 shares of at a market value of $36,500, and that's off a cost basis of $35,000. So overall, it's made a little bit of money. Now, Charles Schwab here gives this a D rating, but it gives every stock that I own a D rating just because they don't really like growth stocks. They're more focused on value stocks. Now, Datadog is a data company. They unite a company's applications, their infrastructure, and their security all through a single pane of glass. This helps companies uncover huge amounts of hidden value within their business, and the service essentially pays for itself. Last quarter, Datadog saw 83% revenue growth year over year, which is their second quarter of over 80% revenue growth. And that's coming from a company that makes over $1 billion in revenue every year. So even though they're at a pretty large scale, they're still growing extremely quickly. Datadog also recently obtained FedRAMP approval, which opens them up to start working with the single largest client in the entire world, which is the US government. Now, companies are only going to produce more and more data every single year. And with Datadog growing extremely quickly, it is not only growing within its own market, the market itself is growing as well, which positions Datadog very well for the future. And that's why this is my highest conviction position overall. Number two, we have Snowflake, which I currently own 160 shares of at a value of $23,000. And that's off a cost basis of around $30,000. So it's down around $7,000 dollars from when I bought it, which was only around a month ago. Now, Snowflake has always been an exceptionally well-performing company. They make it easier to do stuff with your data. In the same way that building on the cloud was an order of magnitude more efficient than hosting stuff in your own data centers, Snowflake makes dealing with your data in order of magnitude easier than building your own custom software in the cloud. Snowflake grew their revenue over 100% last quarter, which would be super exciting for any other company. But honestly, for Snowflake, that's just par for the course. In fact, the only reason that I saw sold out of Snowflake after owning it around a year ago was because of their valuation. At its peak, Snowflake was sitting at a price to sales ratio of nearly 120, which is very, very high. But since that time, the company's stock price has decreased by 60%. And on top of that, the company's revenue has grown 60%. So if you add 60% onto 60%, the company is effectively only worth 36% of what it was last November which to me seems like a pretty good deal. This is the first time I've seen Snowflake anywhere close to a reasonable value since they IPO'd. And so I've been buying more and more into the company even as they've been decreasing over the past month. Now, while I do like to invest in individual stocks, I realize that diversification is important, especially when unexpected events like a pandemic or a recession or heck, record high inflation can come up. But did you know that you can invest outside of stocks and even real estate and put money into art? In fact, the art market tends to perform better in periods of high inflation. And this video sponsor, Masterworks, is democratizing the art market by allowing anyone to buy and sell fractional shares in high value works of art. Since 2017, they've sold three separate paintings, each returning over 30% net IRR to their investors. And contemporary art prices in general outperformed the S&P 500 by 164% over the past 26 years. Now, obviously past returns are no guarantee of future returns, but as Ray Dalio says, that's the holy grail of investing. 
testing. Now there is a waitlist to join Masterworks, but if you sign up using the link in the description, you can completely skip the waitlist and sign up today. Masterworks also has all the tools needed to research your art investments, such as their price database, where you can search for specific artists and see how much previous art has sold for. Or you can buy and sell shares in the artwork on their secondary market, almost like a stock market for art. And all these tools are completely free for Masterworks investors. So go ahead and scroll down and click the link in the description to skip the waitlist and start investing with Masterworks today. And now let's move on to my next stock. My third largest portfolio is Cloudflare, which I currently own 317 shares of at a value of $17,700. And that's off a cost basis of around $20,000. So it's lost around two and a half thousand dollars. Now that's not entirely accurate because I did sell some Cloudflare on the way down. And then I've also bought more Cloudflare recently in the past month. Cloudflare is a company that is trying to make the internet itself work better. They started out by hosting websites and then they realized that they could protect those websites with firewalls. But then they realized if they're analyzing all that traffic anyway, they can not only block bad actors, but optimize the experience for good actors. This is one of the most innovative companies that I invest in and they have launched continuously new products every single year. Now they are not yet profitable, but that's because they invest so much money into creating new products. I counted 10 new products that the company launched just in March of this year. Now Cloudflare recently reported earnings for their last quarter and they reported 50% revenue growth, which is not really a surprise considering they've returned basically 50% revenue growth every year for the last half decade. And honestly, if you have any interest in this company, I would highly recommend reading the blog by Matthew Prince, the CEO of the company. He's really good at writing and breaking down complex ideas into pretty simple to understand terms. Number four on our list is Zscaler, which I own 112 shares of at a value of $14,500. And that's off an initial investment of around $27,500. So this has lost almost 50% of its value with a good chunk of that happening in just the last month. Now Zscaler focuses on security, specifically zero trust security. If you think of a traditional company, they protect themselves by setting up a firewall on the outside of their company. So no bad guys can get in. The problem is once the bad guys are in, they basically have free reign. Zero trust security makes it so that every person, every application, every computer on the network has to authenticate before it talks to anybody else. This way, even if the bad guys get inside, they can't really do anything once they're there. Now Zscaler is also reporting earnings on May 26th. And in a best case scenario, I would hope that they accelerate their revenue once again, like they've done the last four quarters with their last quarter reporting 63% revenue growth year over year. Zscaler also has a 125% dollar base net retention rate, which means that for every dollar a customer spends this year, they can expect them to spend $1.25 next year, which is a really good sign that customers like the product because the more they use it, the more they wanna use it for. And considering the accelerating landscape of cyber threats and large scale data breaches, people are going to be looking for more security companies that are native to the cloud like Zscaler. And as long as long as Zscaler continues to execute as well as they have thus far, that's a $72 billion market opportunity just waiting for them to take over. Next up, we have Zoom Info, which I own 194 shares of at a value of $8,000. And that's off an initial investment of 12,000. So it's down around $4,000 overall. Zoom Info is basically a marketing slash data company. One of their best features is that they are B2B or business to business, meaning that they sell most of their products to other businesses or even enterprises. This is a good thing when we're entering hard times because businesses tend to be less affected than individual consumers, especially if your product is making them more money. Zoom Info is extremely sticky once they onboard a new customer and they grew their revenue 58% last year. This is also one of the few companies on this list that is actually profitable. They had a positive gap operating margin at 13% and they have a much larger positive adjusted operating margin at 39%. They also launched Marketing OS this quarter, which is an account-based marketing platform that helps convert leads into buyers. And they also had two acquisitions. They acquired Comparably, a suite of software as a service solutions for recruitment marketing and employer branding. And they acquired Dogpatch Advisors, a sales advisory consultancy. In their investor presentation, Zoom Info pointed out how many inefficiencies there were in sales and marketing simply due to how fractured the landscape was in terms of software. And while Zoom Info doesn't yet solve all of the sales and marketing needs for a company, it cuts across all these different areas of sales and marketing and combines them all into a single platform platform, which unlocks huge value for companies that use all their different products. With a growing total addressable market of $70 billion, Zoom Info still has a lot of room to grow. Plus they've started expanding into India, Israel, and the UK. Next up, we have Upstart, which I own 148 shares of at a value of $7,000. And that's off an initial investment of $32,000. So overall, this is my worst performing position by far, which is partly because the market got a little bit
little bit too hot on Upstart and I ended up buying quite a few shares near the peak. And also because the fintech market in general is down substantially over the past few months. Now what Upstart does is offer AI lending services. So a traditional lender will look at one number, your credit score, to determine whether or not you qualify for a loan. Upstart looks at thousands of different data points and feeds them into an AI model, which then determines should they offer you a better interest rate than their competitors or can they offer a loan to someone who would not qualify under a traditional FICO score. And while Upstart's stock price has been declining, nobody's been questioning the quality of their actual product, which they've continued to gain more and more banking customers who they are able to sell their loans to. Now, up until this point, Upstart has been very focused on the personal loan market and they've been completely dominating that space. But they're now also moving into some larger markets such as auto lending and home mortgages. They're still in the early stages of auto lending, but if they have the same success there that they had in personal loans, this could easily quadruple the size of Upstart in a relatively short amount of time. Next up, we have Sentinel One, which I own 274 shares of at a value of $6,000. And that's off an initial investment of just over $12,000. So it's lost around half of its value. Again, it's hard to say why the market is discounting Sentinel One so heavily, especially considering how well the company is performing. If you remember CrowdStrike, which is a company I owned for a few years and made over a 300% return in, Sentinel One looks a lot like CrowdStrike did a few years ago. They're growing their revenue at 120% per year with their number of customers increasing 70% year over year. And all that growth is happening while the company is becoming more profitable and their margins are actually getting even better. Plus they're investing money into improving their product over time. Now Sentinel One is different from Zscaler in that Sentinel One is more like a super advanced antivirus while Zscaler is more about networking security. So they don't compete directly. It's not often that you find a company that has a clear plan to continue growing into their market, has improving top line numbers and is becoming more profitable over time, but Sentinel One checks all three of those boxes. Now next up we have C Limited, which I own 23 shares of at a value of $1,800 and that's off an initial investment of $5,500. So this stock is actually down maybe even more than Upstart. Now I'm not gonna talk about this company too much because I actually sold them earlier today because C Limited has slowly decelerated revenue each of their subsequent quarters, even though the company is still growing very quickly. If you do want more information on C Limited, I have done some past videos on them, but I'm going to be exiting the stock for now because they seem like more of a turnaround opportunity rather than a hyper growth company, which means that the last stock in my portfolio is SoFi, which I currently own 171 shares of at a value of $1,200, and that's down a little over 50% from my initial investment of $3,000. Now, SoFi is a company that wants to become the financial source of the next generation. They have a lending business, they have a technology platform, which they want to become the AWS of fintechs, and they have financial services, such as their investing app and just the SoFi app in general. Now, SoFi recently reported earnings, and unlike pretty much every other company in the financial services space, they have actually performed extremely well over the past three months. While Upstart, Robinhood, and Lending Club were all down significantly significantly following their earnings, SoFi has actually improved its price since then. SoFi's business model is to essentially capture customers using their financial services like SoFi Invest or SoFi Relay, and then funnel them down to more valuable areas of the company such as lending. They're then using all that money to invest into their technology platform, which they see as running the entire financial space at some point in the future, taking us from the 1970s technology that banks run on now and into the 21st century. Now, one of the big pieces of news around SoFi recently is the fact that they may undergo a reverse split in their stock price. This means that every stock would essentially combine and you'd have one new stock issued that's double the price. So there's no change in the fundamental value of the business. It's really just moving money around. That being said, the reason SoFi would do this is because if SoFi stock price gets too low, there are certain institutional investors who are not allowed to invest in stocks below a certain price to avoid them trading penny stocks. Now, I personally don't think that this will have a material effect on most investors, but I can understand where some people people are coming from. The best argument I've seen for why a reverse stock split matters is the fact that previous companies that have undergone a reverse stock split tend to underperform the markets. The problem is, I think that to come to that conclusion, you have to look at the data a little bit skewed. You see, what kind of companies are there that will undergo a reverse stock split? 
it's generally companies that have seen their stock price decline very rapidly in a short amount of time. So if we looked at all the companies that have had their stock prices decline and then compare that to companies that have undergone a reverse stock split, I'm guessing that we're not gonna see quite the same discrepancy as we do against the general market. So while yes, we could rely on a general rule of thumb that reverse stock splits are bad, we could also look at more specific data behind the actual company itself and see is the company performing worse than it was before or is this just the market revaluing the stock. So I personally am not super worried about a reverse split, especially with SoFi performing better than pretty much any other fintech company out there today. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.